you're all, my name is Rahul Prakash and uh, I'm the publisher at In-House Community. And on behalf of the In-House Community, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar today, which is Future of Energy, a Legal Update. A great deal of thanks goes out to our sponsors and co-hosts for today, namely Chandler MHM Limited from Thailand. Uh, we have DFDL and VLAF. And also a very special thanks to Zigrid Vetwa, who will be joining us uh, for a Q&A today. Well, in today's webinar, you'll have the advantage of learning about important changes, current landscape, and the future of energy sector in Thailand, Vietnam, and Myanmar from leading lawyers in the field who will be presenting today. Um, we'll start this webinar with a presentation by uh, David Beckstead. The presentation will be about Thailand's energy transition, the current trends and future prospects. Uh, he'll be talking about the industry and market context and the practical consequences of the Thailand's energy transition. Then we'll move on to implications of Vietnam's new PPP laws to energy projects, which will be presented by Voha Duen from VLAF. She'll be talking about incentives, investor selection, capital requirements, governing laws, dispute resolution, future of the LNG to power projects in her presentation. Post her presentation, we will change the pace a little bit and uh, get into an energy in-house inside Q&A with Zigrid Betwer of DNV. We'll be posing some questions to her and getting her insights as, uh, as an in-house counsel. Once we're done with that Q&A, our final presentation for the day would be on Myanmar and the latest market developments uh, of the energy sector in 2020 and 21. We'll be talking about William Greenlee and Rohan Vishai from DFDL will be presenting, and they'll be talking about legal and regulatory framework for projects land licensing and challenges with the framework, financing options, and the future outlook, which is very important when we're talking about Myanmar and the confidence of corporations going in. Just a little bit about uh, in-house community. Our mission is to empower and strengthen and educate in-house counsel for the benefit of all and to strengthen legal and ethical compliance for everyone. We are a community of about 17,000 in-house counsel and compliance members all along the Silk Road. We do host webinars. We have a newsletter called the IFC Briefing, which goes to all in-house counsel and uh, other private practice lawyers as well. We also published a magazine called the IFC. It's an e-format magazine. Uh, we've uh, published uh, two, uh, the third one, the Legal Innovation and Technology Report, will be published next week, so keep an eye out on that. In fact, this webinar is a follow-up to our last or uh, the latest issue that we published, which was, uh, which featured the Projects and Energy Report. So it has articles from uh, the participating firms today, as well as the Q&A from Zgrid Vera. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to invite David Beckstead of Chandler MHM to lead us through Thailand's energy transition, the current trends, and future prospects. Hi, David. Hi, Rahul. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, just I just would like to introduce, if just uh, just quickly introduce you. I think it's very important that uh, our attendees know. David is a counsel at Chandler MHM Limited, and he's a member of the firm's Energy and Infrastructure Practice Group. He has vast experience representing lenders and project sponsors in the oil and gas, mining, renewable energy, and manufacturing sectors. David has also advised on numerous complex commercial transactions, such as cross-border joint ventures, M&As, loan portfolio acquisitions, and greenfield infrastructure product, uh, projects. So thank you very much for uh, uh, co-hosting this, uh, this webinar with us. And uh, over to you, David, you can share your screen. Okay, well, thanks very much, Rahul, for that. I will screen shared here. 
Okay. Thank you again for that uh, kind introduction, Rahul. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much for, for having, having me here to speak about Thailand's energy transition. I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from my co-panelists as well uh, and hearing specifically about uh, you know, the, the updates that are uh, coming up in, in their various jurisdictions. Um, I'm going to speak today, uh, there we are, um, just to give kind of an overview of, of, uh, of, of where my presentation will, will go today. I'm going to start off with a little bit of, of background and industry context. And so where Thailand's energy sector currently sits and, and what are the trends that are, are foreseeable in, in the coming future. Um, next, I'd like to jump into uh, the natural gas market and especially the, the increasing role uh, that LNG is, is playing and is going to play in the future in Thailand's energy sector. Uh, and then sort of switching gears to the solar market and looking specifically at the kind of off-grid and behind the meter, uh, you know, rooftop solar uh, production in particular, um, and just give an update on, on that as well. And then finally, if, if there's enough time, I'll, I'll sort of touch base on, on some of the future prospects and, and where, uh, you know, just give uh, kind of my ideas as to where I, I think Thailand's energy sector is headed and, and what are some things to look out for. So without further ado, jumping in. Um, just to give a little bit of background, oops, sorry, background uh, in, in industry context. So this pie chart uh, here essentially shows uh, Thailand's uh, electricity mix. So this is electricity generation in Thailand broken down by, by um, fuel source. So the first thing, of course, that, that jumps out is that natural gas down here plays uh, a very important role, obviously, in Thailand's electricity uh, uh, mix. 56% uh, of electricity in Thailand on grid is, is produced from, from natural gas. Uh, the next biggest source is coal and lignite. That share has, has been de decreasing slightly over the past uh, 10 or 20 years, as, as the next slide will actually show, uh, followed by imported electricity. That's mostly imports coming from Laos, mostly hydro projects in Laos, which, are, which, which sell electricity to Thailand uh, to the grid. And then finally, renewable energy here at 10%, and hydro is, this is domestic hydro, is separated at 2%. Renewable energy has really picked up over the past uh, 10 to 20 years, you know, starting essentially from, from zero 20 years ago to, to where it is now. Now, I should mention that this is the on-grid uh, electricity mix. Um, so what I mean by that is any electricity that's produced uh, behind the meter or off-grid, so in particular rooftop solar projects, they are not included within this figure. So the actual share of, elect of electricity that's generated from renewable sources is probably bigger than 10%. I don't have the precise figure, but this is the on-grid uh, figure uh, for, for Thailand at the moment. Oops, excuse me. The, the next slide uh, essentially shows the previous slide. So this is, it shows the share um, of the electricity mix by, by each fuel source over the course of, of the past uh, 20 years. So comparing 20, 2000, excuse me, to 2010 uh, and then 2019. So what you can see right away here is that coal is, is fairly stagnant. It has not really increased much. In fact, it's decreased slightly. Um, natural gas peaked in 2010 and it's been decreasing as a share of Thailand's electricity mix. Uh, that being said, it's still obviously incredibly important to Thailand's overall um, electricity production, and it is by far the, the biggest source of, of fuel. But in terms of its place as a share of, of Thailand's electricity mix, it's, it's decreased actually over the past 10 years. But if you look at um, where Thailand was in, in 2010, if you add coal to, to natural gas, it's around 72% plus around 18%. That's around 90% of Thailand's electricity in 2010 was produced from, from these two uh, fossil fuels. Um, and that's obviously uh, changed quite a bit in the past 10 years. Um, renewables has seen the biggest uptick going from, as I mentioned, almost nothing in 2000 to around 10%, actually greater than 10% of Thailand's overall electricity here uh, in 2019. And then of course, imports have increased as well. Um, so the, the natural gas, the amount that natural gas contributes to the overall electricity mix will probably decrease, but that's more to you know, the increasing uh, demand coming from renewables, as well as new projects, um, mainly from Laos, uh, coming online in, in the coming years. Okay, so moving on to uh, Thailand's natural gas uh, sector specifically. So this, this chart shows uh, Thailand's domestic natural gas reserves uh, in the upstream sector. So this precise figures are really not important. Um, what these two, three lines show are Thailand's proven, uh, a possible and probable natural gas reserves. 
So I think what you can see very clearly from, from, this, um, from this graph is that in 2000, we were up here, whereas in 2019, it's obviously down here. So it's a, it's a downward trajectory. Um, and uh, because natural gas is a finite resource, it's not renewable. Uh, this is almost certainly going to continue on this trajectory um, for this foreseeable future. There has not been any significant new exploration uh, for, for upstream gas in, in Thailand over the past 10 years or so, mostly because there has not been a, a, wide, a, a broad um, bidding round released by Thailand's uh, Department of Mineral Fuels, which is the upstream regulator. So uh, it's likely that this trend will continue on unless there is uh, a significant new natural gas uh, discovery, um, which seems unlikely at the moment. But at any rate, uh, Thailand's natural gas reserves will eventually uh, be depleted. And then the next point to, to discuss is actually on um, the source of natural gas actually in Thailand. So uh, the top line here is it represents Thailand's domestic production. So these are concession areas that are producing uh, gas right now uh, in Thailand. So this is obviously the biggest source of natural gas that, that's being used within Thailand. And what I mean by that is used by uh, power plants as well as industrial users as a feedstock. Um, so obviously the biggest share is coming from, is still coming from domestic uh, uh, production. Uh, this middle line down here represents gas that is being imported from, from pipelines coming from Myanmar. So it's obviously significant, it's a, it's a great amount, but it has not increased very much over the past 15 years as this, this, uh, this chart actually shows. The bottom line here is Thailand's LNG. And of course you can see LNG was literally at zero up until 2011 actually, uh, when the LNG receiving terminal at Maktapuit port in, in Rayong province in the Eastern seaboard uh, came online and began uh, accepting uh, shipments. So from 2011 onwards, LNG has started to play a role uh, in, in, in Thailand's uh, natural gas supply. Now, if you look at the domestic uh, production, obviously it's still on top, but if you see, I don't know what the exact peak year was, but on this graph, it's just five-year intervals. So 2015 appears to be the peak. Sometime around here is the peak. And you can see it's already starting to, to, to have a downward trajectory. So it's fairly clear that if you take the last slide into account on Thailand's proven uh, and, and possible and probable reserves, this line will of course decrease and it will probably start to decrease more sharply in, in the coming years. And on the other hand, LNG is, is going upwards. So obviously these two will intersect uh, at some point in the not too distant future and LNG can be expected to play a, a more predominant role in Thailand's overall gas supply within the next probably five to 10 to maybe 15 years. Okay, just some final thoughts on, on background just to get more industry context. One point to note, I don't have a graph for this, but uh, Thailand's overall electricity consumption uh, is, is, is obviously going upwards as well. So Thailand consumed uh, around 140 terawatt hours in 2008. Uh, by 2018, that had increased to 195 terawatt hours. So that's a 40% increase over a decade. I don't I can't predict the future, but I can uh, be pretty sure that, that that trend is going to continue on uh, and that Thailand, as Thailand becomes more affluent um, and, and uh, demand for electricity from uh, household appliances and, of course, electric vehicles come to mind as more electric vehicles come online, I think it's pretty fair to say that demand for uh, electricity will only increase in Thailand. So this, this figure is almost certainly going to continue rising. The last point I'll, I'll touch on just with regard to uh, you know, industry context is that the potential for greater regional connectivity, it, it's certainly there, um, but it's a little bit uncertain because it, there's a number of, there are a number of uh, geopolitical considerations obviously to take into account. It's not just a pure market, market uh, force that's, that's, uh, that's sort of dictating which way the market goes. Obviously uh, interconnection with, with neighboring countries is, is quite politically sensitive. There is, uh, appears to be a good amount of political will for, for the Thai government to work with uh, its neighboring uh, uh, countries in order to increase connectivity. Uh, but that being said, obviously it's, it's uh, very political in nature and so it's probably beyond my skill set. So I'll, I'll just put a pin in that uh, conversation because I'm probably not qualified to give her any authoritative opinions on it. Okay, uh, jumping ahead to uh, the natural gas market and the increasing role for LNG. Okay, so uh, just to discuss the, the changing landscape of the natural gas market here in Thailand. So anybody who's familiar with Thailand's natural gas market will know um, that the centerpiece is uh, PTT. 
PTT uh, is the former Petroleum Authority of Thailand, which was a state-owned uh, entity uh, that was created by statute. It was privatized uh, about 20 years ago, and so now PTT is a public company that is uh, listed on the Thai Stock Exchange. Uh, but because of this legacy role, it obviously plays, it still plays a central role in Thailand's natural gas markets. So PTT is the owner of the pipeline network uh, for distribution and transmission of natural gas. It's also the owner of the LNG receiving terminal at Mata Put, uh, and it also is a wholesaler of gas. So it plays the dual role of being a seller of gas as well as owning the infrastructure, um, which allows for that sale of gas to occur. So Thailand, uh, excuse me, PTT acquires its, its gas from concessionaires in Thailand. Uh, as well as from uh, the pipelines in Myanmar, as I mentioned previously, and of course from LNG. So these are the sources of gas uh, that PTT is, is purchasing. PTT then sells its gas to, to EGAT, um, which is the Electricity Generating Authority of Thailand, uh, which produces electricity, as well as to uh, independent power producers and small power producers who in turn uh, generate electricity and sell that electricity to EGAT under uh, power purchase agreements. And then, of course, um, EGAT will, will sell the electricity on to the MEA and the PEA, who are the electricity um, uh, distribution utilities. The MEA is for Bangkok and the PEA is for everything outside of Bangkok, who then sell on to end consumers and industrial users. So this is a rough sketch of Thailand's uh, gas market and, and power market, um, you know, very rough, obviously, and just showing some of the key players. Now, the key regulator for all of this, for the entire market, including gas, as well as, as electricity, so gas tra uh, transportation and distribution, as well as electricity generation, uh, transmission and distribution, is the Energy Regulatory Commission, the ERC for short. The ERC is uh, a creation of statute under the Energy Industry Act. Um, so it's only about, uh, I think, around 15 years old or so. And one of its key mandates is to uh, increase competition in the energy sector. So it has a kind of unique position because it can oversee the entire sector, not just, not just electricity, not just gas, but it actually oversees the entire, the entire thing. And so one of the ways uh, the ERC has decided to go about uh, liberalizing the energy sector is to introduce a licensing system for, for various aspects um, you know, of, of involvement within the energy sector, including the ability to, to ship LNG, uh, to import LNG as well. So EGAT was the first entity after PTT to obtain a, an LNG shipping license. So L EGAT can actually import LNG and to use it directly uh, for its power plants. It obtained this license in, I believe, 2017 or 2018. I can't recall the exact year, but a few years ago. Um, so EGAT can actually bypass PTT now. Uh, in addition, and maybe more interesting, um, is that last year uh, the ERC issued two licenses to private entities for the first time to, to ship uh, LNG or to import LNG and to sell it. So we have LNG shippers here who are new actors in this overall structure. Of course, they will have um, you know, interactions with PTT because there are, there are what are called TPA codes, third party access codes. Uh, and those exist for the pipeline network as well as for the receiving terminal. Uh, in addition, you know, the contract matrix kind of looks like this. There's, there's going to be an LNG master sales agreement with, you know, this obviously it just says LNG, but it could be multiple LNG sellers. It's not just one seller. Obviously, there's multiple sellers on the global market, um, but the LNG shippers can procure LNG from overseas. And then, of course, sell that gas on to IPPs or SPPs here in Thailand under gas supply agreements who will then use that, uh, that gas as feedstock for electricity generation. So it will open up the market somewhat. PTT obviously will still own all of the main infrastructure for the, for the foreseeable future, but it does allow other players to get involved in the wholesale business of natural gas in Thailand. So it's, it was an interesting development last year when, when we uh, heard about these licenses uh, being, being uh, awarded. So some of the issues that LNG trading give rise to some of the legal issues, as I mentioned previously, are the third party access codes. So the TPA codes are exactly what they sound like. It's a code of conduct um, that PTT issues to users of its infrastructure, mainly the transmission network, as well as the LNG receiving terminal. So there are two uh, TPA codes, uh, one for each. 
um, and they specify all sorts of, uh, you know, particular aspects of, of what the shippers have to comply with in order to, to make use of, of PTT's infrastructure for LNG and for natural gas. In addition, the shippers will need a terminal use agreement with, you know, the PTT entity that owns the LNG receiving terminal, as well as a throughput agreement in order to transport the natural gas from the LNG receiving terminal onto uh, the power plants who will use the gas as feedstock. Of course, it will also need a gas supply agreement with the IPPs or the SPPs directly, and an LNG master sales agreement with those offshore sellers from, from outside of Thailand. So this introduces, a, the, LN, the, the existence of LNG trading introduces a whole new set of contracts that didn't exist in Thailand until the past year or so. Um, and it's really quite interesting to see how this market it has already started to develop and will continue to, to develop in the future because it's, it's uh, literally, it's a brand new, brand new uh, opportunity here in Thailand. Okay, moving on and sort of changing gears slightly, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the solar market uh, here in Thailand and specifically, uh, discussing uh, rooftop and off-grid or, or behind the meter consumption of, of solar energy. So again, apologies if, if, if for those who don't like uh, structures, but my, my brain tends to think in, in business structures. So uh, hopefully there's others who are in the audience who are like me who appreciate these because I, I find it easier to sort of visualize um, you know, how these business structures actually work. So this is sort of a rough diagram of what we typically see in terms of a um, a rooftop solar business structure here in Thailand. So you'll have a developer over here, uh, shareholders, and they will usually establish an SPV in Thailand uh, in order to uh, develop rooftop solar projects. Of course, the solar SPV will be subject to licensing requirements or, or regulatory requirements from the ERC. Um, the SPV will enter into a long-term power purchase agreement. So it's a, essentially it's a corporate PPA model. There are different models that, that are used, I know, in, in other jurisdictions in Southeast Asia. Thailand, it's, it's typically the corporate PPA model, meaning the solar developer will install uh, the, the panels and the inverters and all the other equipment on, on the factory owner uh, or the other owners, the building owners' uh, facilities. Uh, and then the solar SPB will remain the owner of that equipment and will sell the electricity that's generated to the factory owner under the power purchase agreement. The factory owner will then pay a, a regular tariff, usually on a monthly basis. Um, so this is the typical structure that we see. Now, of course, because solar SPVs or the solar power, excuse me, doesn't generate electricity uh, 24 hours a day. Um, so there's typically still in Thailand, uh, rooftop projects typically still include the interconnection arrangement with, with the local uh, utility. And that's to make sure that there's always a backup supply of, of energy. Um, this is still a structure that we commonly see, mostly because energy storage has not quite taken off in Thailand. So this is still a common structure. Of course, there's there's usually uh, you know the EPC contractor as well. Um, I've included this in, but but actually uh, we also see the structure where uh, the solar SPV itself will will basically do the installation work on its own, and so it won't do the EPC contract at all, and it will just install the project on its own. So just depending on, on the contract structure. This is more or less what we what we see now in Thailand when it comes to rooftop solar, and, and we see this structure repeated quite quite frequently. I just wanted to add in a few additional lines uh, that we don't see in the market yet, but I think are possible and they might be they might be coming in the not too distant future. One is net metering. So at the moment in Thailand, there's no net metering scheme, um, but that is something that the government has actually mentioned on uh, a number of occasions that it is it's an area that it actually wants to uh, you know expand into and, and to introduce this policy, which would essentially allow. Uh, rooftop uh, companies to sell excess uh, energy back to the grid. Of course, net metering schemes, they're very, uh, they're, they're quite technical and then the policymakers have to be careful in how they craft them. So it hasn't quite materialized yet in Thailand, uh, especially for the CNI, the commercial and industrial sectors yet. There was a, a scheme floated a year or two ago, uh, which would essentially open it up uh, more for residential, but we have not seen great penetration of the residential uh, market in Thailand with regard to, to rooftop solar just yet. Um, if there was a net metering scheme, maybe that would change, uh, but at the moment there isn't one. Uh, so this is something which is still uh, to be determined in Thailand, but I think at some point there, there likely would be a net metering scheme uh, put into place. Another uh, potential area is what I just mentioned previously is, is electricity storage. 
so at the moment, we don't see this structure where there's a, a separate electricity storage entity. You know, it probably would work well at an industrial park, for example. I, I did read in the news recently that there is an industrial park that is attempting uh, this structure for the first time. I think it's just early days at the moment, but so we might see our first project come online in this regard. But essentially, the, uh, the, the structure is where the electricity storage a company would be uh, here, but it could be actually under the, the SPV as well. There's no reason why it has to be a separate entity. Uh, and then the electricity would then, uh, you know, get sold on to uh, final customers in this way. Um, so it would either be the same company that, that has rooftop installations on all of these customers' roofs, and then, you know, essentially it's establishing a mini grid. So this is something which could occur in the future. I'm just sort of speculating now, uh, but we haven't seen it yet. The final point I would mention on areas to look for is, is rec trading. Uh, we do see uh, solar projects in Thailand do have uh, environmental attributes included within their power purchase agreements. So solar developers are obviously aware of what renewable energy certificates are. And for those of you who, who are not aware, um, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert at all on, on renewable energy certificates, that's for sure. But obviously, uh, RECs are becoming, a, you know, a very useful secondary uh, income stream for, for solar SPVs, for solar projects around the world, obviously not just in Thailand. So if, if the RECs can be obtained from this energy production, then they can be sold on, uh, on markets outside. My understanding is there are no, uh, there are, or if there are any uh, REC trading markets here in Thailand, they're quite, uh, uh, you know, in their early stages. I stand to be corrected on that. I just, I'm not aware of any, any REC trading that's happening in Thailand. But it's clear that this is something that, that will become of greater significance uh, going forward. So when, when discussing the, the uh, rooftop PPA, just to kind of highlight some of the key provisions that, that are going to be important um, within, within the, the corporate PPA structure. The first one is the ownership of the assets, as well as the use of the rooftop. Actually, these are two separate issues, but ownership of the assets um, is essentially just the point that the, 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 the equipment itself will remain owned by the seller. So it will remain the property of um, the solar SPV. Now, this might seem like an obvious point uh, if you're listening in on this, but the reason why I mention it here is because uh, it's very important that this point gets put into the PPA itself. And the reason for that is the building owner uh, will obtain a building modification permit under its own name to, to modify its building. So it's really important to, to make sure that it's, it's clear within the language of the PPA itself that the solar installations are not a fixture of the building. They, they don't vest with the building owner. They, they remain the property of the seller. So clear language on that point is obviously critical. On top of that, there's also the use of the rooftop. So the most common uh, way that this is affected in Thailand that we see is by a consent letter. So it's essentially the factory owner or the building owner will, will issue a consent letter to the uh, developer to uh, use the roof. Now, we have seen uh, one or two uh, lease agreements, so rooftop lease agreements um, be contemplated. It's not the preferred structure, mostly because of a lease that's longer than three years is going to have to be registered uh, uh, in Thailand. So, you know, there's additional registration fees, which is usually a deterrent to most private parties. So the most common structure we do see, see still is, is the, the consent letter at the moment. The next major point to, to touch on is the consequences of termination as well as the transfer of the building. So corporate PPAs are, are typically, uh, you know, long-term agreements, 15, 20, 25 years. And so in that time, it's foreseeable or it's possible that, that the owner of the building might uh, decide to transfer the building, uh, to, 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 to sell it to a third-party transferee. Uh, so the, the question has to be, well, what happens to the PPA at that time? Is there a put option uh, where the seller can, can require the, the purchasers or the building owner to, to purchase the, the facility itself? Uh, or does, it, does the agreement have to be novated to the transferee? So these are the types of questions that, that need to be included within the PPA itself. In addition, just the consequences of termination need to be thought through very carefully, uh, especially with regard to, let's say, a put option. If there's an event of default by the purchaser, then a put option might be of limited value because the purchaser's main obligation is obviously to, to pay uh, the tariff. So if it has no more you know, assets left or no more resources, then obviously it's going to be difficult to require it to, to, to buy the, the installations themselves. 
Some additional clauses, obviously force majeure, because it's a, it's a long-term agreement, the force majeure clause has to be thought out very, very carefully. The payment terms are usually quite commercial in nature, but it's important that the, the lawyers understand what the payment terms are so that they can properly uh, draft the clauses. Um, output guarantees usually are included as an appendix. And then finally, the ownership of the environmental attributes, and that's in, in connection with the, the rec trading, as, as I just mentioned. Um, the regulatory issues, so the main regulator, as I mentioned in, in one of my previous slides, uh, the ERC, the Energy Regulatory Commission, is the main regulator. When it comes to foreign ownership restrictions, if the, the business model is based on what I just presented, where, where you have the solar SPV who's selling electricity to an end customer, and that's the only business opportunity, or the only business that's being engaged in, uh, then there are no foreign ownership restrictions for that business model. That business model is generally permitted for foreigners. Um, where it can become a little bit tricky is if there's some sort of deviation from that standard business model and whether or not any additional businesses might be deemed as a service, which are strictly regulate, regulated in Thailand. Um, so electricity production on its own is, is fine for foreigners, but if there's anything on the side that looks like a service, then careful consideration of the structure needs to be undertaken. So just some final points on solar. Um, so where we're at today, uh, there's around 3.8 gigawatts of installed capacity of solar. Of that, around 700 gigawatts are behind uh, the meter. Now, all of these are, are greater than figures. And the reason for that is that uh, the, the, there is an exemption for uh, the electricity generating license here in Thailand if a project is less than one megawatt in size. Um, so for the projects that are less than one megawatt in size, they're not included in the ERC statistics for some reason uh, that are publicly available. Uh, maybe the ERC knows the, the, the actual figure. But anyway, so this is the figure for, for licensed projects, but it doesn't include the ones that are not licensed because they're too small. There are a large number of smaller projects, so I, I don't know what the exact figure is, but it's greater than these figures. But that gives a good ballpark anyway. Um, areas of potential for lawyers uh, so refinancing of rooftop portfolios, uh, a lot of the rooftop projects that we've seen in Thailand are being financed through equity financing, essentially. So the shareholders are injecting, in, injecting equity, and that's basically being used to finance the construction. It's very foreseeable that in the not too distant future, uh, a lot of these developers that have significant portfolios, maybe 20, 30 megawatts in size, might use those assets as security in order to obtain financing for future development. I think that that's a very likely scenario, uh, or there might be some other refinancing structures that need to, to be implemented. So I think that's something to look out for. Um, m and is very hot right now for rooftop solar. Uh, there's, there's obviously some market consolidation going on. We're handling uh, multiple deals at the moment, uh, M&A deals involving rooftop solar assets. Um, and then finally, just future potential for, for greenfield um, developments. Uh, so I mentioned floating solar in here because that's another area that we, we are seeing a little bit of interest in for floating solar assets, which are uh, behind the meter or off grid, as well as further uh, rooftop developments. There's, there still is uh, quite a bit of potential in Thailand. So just sort of closing up my last few minutes, other areas to watch and just sort of, uh, you know, predicting the future, I suppose. Uh, Cross-border integration, I, I mentioned that on previously that I'm not really qualified to, 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 to know where that is going to head. So I'll just maybe pass over that. Um, in terms of technological uh, developments, I think uh, grid scale batteries, new technology for, for, for energy storage. I think there's a lot of really interesting new technologies that are coming online now using gravity, for instance. So basically the same principles as, as pump storage. There's a number of new uh, startups that were, you know, a few years ago were in the R&D stages and now they're at, you know, preliminary stages for implementation. So as those, those companies mature and those technologies come online, I think there's a lot of great potential. And then finally, hydrogen as well. There's not really a hydrogen market yet in Thailand, but I think Thailand has great potential to be uh, you know, a producer of, of green and gray hydrogen, uh, especially green hydrogen with the abundant uh, solar potential here in Thailand. So I think as, as that market develops, both in Thailand as well as globally, I think that's an area to, to watch for, whether or not Thailand will be uh, you know, potentially a hub for, for hydrogen uh, production in the future. I know at least one of our clients has, has already spoken uh, to, to us about, about this potential for one of their projects going forward. So I think it's an, a really interesting area to keep an eye on. The last point I'll mention is on carbon pricing. Thailand currently does not have uh, any type of carbon pricing, so there's no carbon tax or cap and trade mechanism. Um, if that policy were to be put in place, obviously it would, you know, spur development more into the renewable sector. Um, but that, that's something obviously to keep an eye on as well and to see uh, which direction 
policymakers take in that regard. So on that point, I believe I will um, end the main part of my presentation. There is uh, my background in case uh, anybody needs to reach out. My, my uh, email address is there. But if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to take your questions either in the Q&A. Q I guess it's in the Q&A function now. Right. Uh, thank you very much, David. I think uh, we've just got in uh, a question from one of the uh, one of the attendees. The question I'll read it out over here: Is there pure project financing for solar power projects in Thailand? Uh, are there any security interests? Yeah, that's a great question. So we don't see uh, the traditional project financing models for for rooftop solar developments here in Thailand. I think the main reason for that is just the size of the projects. The projects they're quite small. Obviously, they're, you know the biggest rooftop projects are only going to be a few megawatts, maybe three, four, or five. Uh, megawatts in size, and those are really significant rooftop projects. What we have seen, there's a couple things that I'll mention in terms of financing. So what we have seen is, I, I alluded to it previously, where it's essentially, uh, you know, portfolio being used uh, in order to finance future developments. So that would be existing projects that are already online. So the construction risk is, is gone and the construction risk has already been addressed. And, and companies are using those assets in order to secure in order to secure further developments. In terms of the security interests that are involved, I think the main, to be quite honest, the main security interests that the lenders tend to be interested in is the assignment under the PPA, the security assignment. There, are, I mean, typically the lenders would, would want as much security as they can have. So if there are share pledges, for instance, or, or potential uh, you know, mortgages over the machinery or things of that nature, obviously the lenders would generally prefer to have that. But usually these financing structures are really dependent on the identity of the off taker. And so it has to be a really credit worthy uh, purchaser for the lenders to get comfortable with, with the arrangement. So it's less to do with you know, your traditional uh, project financing scheme where the lenders can step in and take over. It's really more to do with whether or not the off taker is credible and can, can continue to pay. Great, uh, thank you very much for that question. And we have another question from Edmund. The question is, what is the market for carbon capture and sequestration in Thailand? That's a very good question, Edmund. Thanks very much for that. The short answer is there is no market that I am aware of, and that could just be my, my ignorance on the matter, but it's not something um, that we see. Um, carbon, carbon capture and sequestration, I think both for, for power plants as well as you know, potentially, I suppose, for other industrial users, and then other maybe oil and gas companies as well, obviously, is something that, that should be, um, you know, companies should be keeping an eye on. Uh, to my knowledge, I, I'm not aware of any uh, particular uh, market, you know, market-led uh, responses to this particular issue at this stage. Um, I, I suppose the government utilities could, uh, you know, impose some requirements within the terms of their PPAs, but um, as of today, I don't think we've seen that. Right. Thank you very much. I think we have some time for one more question, if that's okay. Uh, sure. This is about LNG projects. So what are some of the challenges facing practitioners in Thailand when working on LNG projects? Sure. So LNG projects are, are essentially brand new here in Thailand. So I suppose the, the challenge is the fact that it's a brand new landscape. And so, you know, when I was thinking about uh, LNG projects, I, I'm from Canada originally. So obviously there's a lot of snow in Canada. Uh, and I remember one of my law professors way back when uh, gave the analogy that it's a little bit difficult whenever you're the first person to walk through the snow after it snows in Canada, because it's quite hard for anybody who's ever walked through snow in the audience. It's quite hard to walk through snow um, because it's cold and because, you know, your feet get dragged down. But then if you're the second person or the third person to walk through, it's quite easy to do so because you can just follow in the same footsteps as the person ahead of you. So I think for LNG, the biggest, the biggest, you know, the challenge right now that we all have is that this is a brand new market. And so there there is no templates necessarily for, for how these, these projects are structured in Thailand. There are templates, obviously, for, for other jurisdictions, and we can obviously learn from them, and we can take the experience that we get in other jurisdictions and, and try to, to implement it here. But it's all brand new for Thailand, and it's all brand new actors involved. So I think that's the biggest challenge. Um, but it's also obviously one of the points that's the most exciting part uh, here in Thailand and in, in being involved in LNG projects. Great. And just very briefly, one last question. Sure. From a legal perspective, what are some of the differences between behind the meter rooftop versus floating 
solar projects? Yeah, sure. Uh, and this actually, this relates to a point that, that Anne had raised in, in her comment about um, uh, project financing for, for solar. I, I meant to, to mention this. We do see some financing uh, for, for, for um, floating solar projects, mostly because the size is a little bit bigger. So some of the floating solar projects are 8, 10, 15 megawatts in size. Um, so the biggest difference between the two, structurally, they're very similar. If it's behind the meter uh, floating solar, I mean, so if, if the purchasers are private parties, I think some of the differences are obviously for rooftop, the interconnection point, so it's more of a, a technical issue rather than a legal one, but the interconnection point will be obviously within the building itself. Whereas for floating, you have to be a little bit more concerned as to where the, the, uh, the, the transmission lines will, will be laid, the, the, the electricity lines will be laid from, from the, the pond or, or wherever else the floating uh, solar in, panels are installed to the, uh, the final uh, locations. So uh, those, are, those are some of the key uh, differences, more technical, uh, but obviously the, the lawyers need to be aware of, of what those differences are so that they draft the, the agreements accordingly. Great, well, thank you very much, David. That was quite, quite an insightful presentation. And thank you very much for the questions as well. If you have any questions for David or about, in general, about energy sector in Thailand, uh, feel free to email David directly. Uh, we've shared his email ID in the chat box. Uh, it's david.b at mhm-global.com. Right, well, thank you very much again, David. Thanks for and uh, we'll see you soon, thank you very much. On to our next presentation, and this is uh, about implications of Vietnam's new PPP laws to the energy projects. And for that, I am very happy and uh, honored to welcome Duen from uh, VLAF. Now, Duen, if you'd like, you can turn your webcam on and uh, put your uh, mic on. While we're waiting for Duen to... Uh, hi, Duen, I can see you now. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. Now, Duen is uh, the co-head of VLAF's Energy and Projects Practice. Uh, she advises the development, financing, and m and of projects, including infrastructure, energy, petrochemical, and real estate projects. In her presentation today, she will be touching on incentives, investor selection, capital requirements, the governing laws, dispute resolution, and also the future of LNG to power projects. Now, Duane, I'd like you to share your screen, please, and uh, you know the webinar is over to you. Thank you so much, Rahul. Is the screen all right? Yes, it's fine. We can see the screen. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining the webinar today, and thank you, ITC, for organizing this event. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you all. And I hope all are going well, safe and healthy. I would like, according to recommendations from some of our in-houses, uh, I broaden the scope of the discussion today a little bit relating to the evolving regulatory framework affecting energy projects, which is not only the PPP uh, legal framework, but the investment legal framework in general, and hope that that would be helpful to all of us. And why energy is a hot topic in Vietnam these days and this year uh, for investors who are interested in Vietnam energy, we know that there is a draft power master plan number eight being evaluated by the government. A draft was released in March this year and another draft would be released very soon uh, within this year, which set forth and uh, propose a plan which is overall for the pipeline of Vietnam power projects in the next 25 years. And why this is important? It's important because the power master plan number eight, even though it is a working in progress, it show how Vietnam is committed to shift the focus from conventional coal-fired power to cleaner energy, including wind power, solar power, and LNG to power. If you would see on the screen from almost zero megawatt this year, wind power would be increased to would be increased to nearly 45,000 megawatt by 2020, uh, 2040. And LNG to power would be increased to almost 37,000 megawatts 
by 2040 from zero megawatt today. So from now to the next 10 years, during the next decade, Vietnam will need about 180 billion US dollars investment to meet the expansion needs for gas and renewable energy, as well as for LNG gas terminal. So the top and Vietnam is already starting to set forth the legal framework, even though it's still an early process, the laws are being changed to start to accommodate the system for the pipeline of new energy projects of the country in the years to come. And from the beginning of this year, a set of new laws have taken effect. We are talking about the new investment law, the new investment degree, the new PPP law, new PPP degree, and the new enterprises law and enterprises degree. And that is the topic of our discussion today. The key highlight of the key changes under these new laws, which would have some impact on the portfolio of energy projects of the country in the years to come. Before we go to the key changes, to be helpful to all of us, I would provide a brief overview of the roadmap of key investment licenses under Vietnamese law for energy projects. To operate a new energy projects, these are the key licenses we need to have under the laws. We need the master plan approval. That is the approval for the project to be included in the master plan. Any project needs to have this approval. Then we would have the investment in principle approval, which is the, uh, the important approval for the project to kick off. The, after we get the in principle approval, we will be able to obtain the investment registration certificate or what we usually call IRC, which is the key investment license. But under the new laws, this IRC would be required only for IPP project, which is private owned independent power producer. A PPP power project is no longer subject to this requirement. Instead, a PPP power project would need to obtain a PPP project approval. And with PPP, I'm referring to public-private partnership, which is investment according to a contract between the private investor and the state authority. Now, after we get the investment certificate, we need to incorporate the project company and the license certifying the incorporation of the project company under Vietnamese laws is the Enterprise Registration Certificate, which we typically call ERC. And finally, we need the environmental approval based on a proposed environmental protection plan proposed by the investor. These are all of the key investment license before the project can move ahead and these exclude permits and license particularly required for the construction process. Now that is an overview of the required license. We would go to the next step where we highlight the key changes under the new laws that would affect these process. I will start with the most positive news first because the most positive news is the best to hear. And the most positive change is the introduction of a new special investment incentives. The new investment law oh, introduced a special concept called special investment incentive. And if we remember for many years in Vietnam, the corporate income tax rate in Vietnam ranged from 10% to 20%. 20% is a standard rate. We may get an incentive rate from 10 to 15% for a specified period if the project is considered an encouraged project. The new law now introduces a very special incentive, which is the lowest corporate income tax rate ever had in Vietnam history, which is 5%, subject to the prime minister approval. What projects may be eligible for this special incentive? There are three categories of project, but of these three on the screen, the red one, the third one would be particularly relevant to energy projects. The third one say, a project falling on the list of special encouraged sectors with a minimum capital of 30,000 billion dong, 
disbursed minimum 10,000 billion dong within three years after being licensed. And to know, especially in current sectors, uh, a statutory list. There is a statutory list which might be amended from time to time. But usually and typically, projects that use special high technology or special new technology under the law on high technology or the law on technology transfer would typically fall on this list. And therefore, it is very hopeful for the large scale air energy to power project and the large scale offshore wind power projects. But to know that the government has already released a draft decision to guide the implementation of this provision. So we need to monitor what would be the final decision guiding how the government interpret these three categories and how long the 5% incentive rate would be given to be monitored. The next important change relating to foreign ownership. Now for many years, we believe there's no foreign ownership issue with respect to power generation. Power generation can be 100% foreign owned and there's no issue with respect to foreign ownership that may no longer be the case under the new laws. The new laws introduce the concept of market access conditions, uh, which is a similar concept under Vietnam investment treaties and introduce the list of sectors where business access, market access is restricted and the list where market access may be subject to conditions. Then the laws provide a long list of possible market access conditions, which is longer than the list in the old laws. And the new list include foreign ownership limit condition, which is traditionally has been in place for many years, but and form of investment, which is also traditionally in place for many years. There's also conditions on scope of investment activities, capability of investor and his partner, use of land, labor, and natural resources, supply of public goods, which fall within the state exclusivity under the laws, and participation in state privatization plans. Now on this list, which of the new market access conditions would be particularly relevant to power projects, use of land. So under the new laws, use of land might be subject to scrutiny. The new laws now consider market access to include evaluation relating to location of the land use rights, other than master plan issues, there might be issue on whether the land is located on the border, the, the, the border of the country, on coastal areas, on islands, on any other locations which might be considered sensitive to national defense or security. And this now being put in place as a possible market access conditions. And this would be particularly relevant to energy projects because all energy projects would be using land. This is the next highlighted important change under the new laws. Now, because foreign ownership is subject to market access conditions, and a concept which is also very important is foreign investor equivalent. What is a foreign investor equivalent? This concept has been in place for several years now, since 2015, it's not new. But then we let's refresh this concept first before we talk about the change. If a foreign investor A form a subsidiary in Vietnam, and then the subsidiary in Vietnam make an investment in Vietnam, the question is whether the subsidiary is considered a foreign investor. And that triggered the concept foreign investor equivalent. So the laws explain that in certain circumstances, that subsidiary would be considered a foreign investor equivalent, but not always the case. So the threshold you typically is you control. If you control, if a foreign investor control the company, then the company is considered a foreign investor equivalent. And the indication is that the subsidiary in that case would be subject to investment procedures and market access conditions 
as a foreign investor. And the change mainly is a very small change, but an important change. The same concept applies, but the new, under the old law, the concept is at least 51%. So foreign investor own at least 51%, then the company is considered a foreign investor equivalent. The new law changed the at least 51% to more than 50%. So now if a company in Vietnam is more than 50% owned by foreign investors, that company would be considered a foreign investor equivalent. But there's also a more complex concept of how many layers of holdings would apply for you to be considered a local investor. But that is a very complex issue and that's not the topic of our discussion today, even the limit of time. I would not go into the detail, but in the slides that you will receive, there would be two slides that give an illustration example of how the concept of foreign investor equivalent applies in practice. You can look at the slide later and can send me any questions you have. Um, this becomes a very important issue given that now, remember, land use rights would be relevant as a market access condition for the energy sector. Now I go to the next topic of key change and that is the in-principle approval, the jurisdiction for the in-principle approval. What is, we have talked earlier relating to the roadmap, right, of the key licenses and the in-principle approval is one of the key license for an energy project. What is an in-principle approval and how important it is? The in-principle approval is the approval issued by the competing authority which state a number of key features of the project such as the objective, the location, the scale, the term of a project, the duration of the project, the investor or the method to select the investor and other special policies applicable to the project if relevant. And if it is required, the in-principle approval must be obtained before the IRC can be issued. Now, most of the energy project would be subject to the in-principle approval. The question, the key question is what, who has the jurisdiction to give the in-principle approval? And the two key authority that we are talking about is whether it is the jurisdiction of the prime minister or it is a jurisdiction of the local provincial authority. And this is where the major change occurred. In the past, under the old laws, any project with a total investment capital at least 5,000 billion dong would be subject to the prime minister jurisdiction. This is about 200 something million US dollars. Um, and therefore, most of the larger scale energy project would fall under the prime minister jurisdiction. Under the new laws, this scenario is removed. So 5,000 billion is no longer the relevant threshold for the determination of a jurisdiction. And under the new laws, that means most IPP and PPP power project will be subject to the provincial jurisdiction and no longer subject to the prime minister in principle approval jurisdiction. What does this mean? This if the project is subject to the prime minister jurisdiction, then when you get when you apply for the approval, and in the future, whenever you make important changes or amendments to the project, you need to go back to the prime minister. And the prime minister would not make decision until he has collected positive opinions from all of the relevant ministries. This process may take one year. Or longer. On the other hand, if you are subject to the provincial jurisdiction, you would avoid all of those nuisances and the approval process typically could be much shorter. This is the indication and it is another good news for energy projects. We will talk about the good things, right? The selection investor, the selection of investor is the next key change 
which is a combination of the positive and the negative. Selection of investor is one of the quite confusing topic for energy projects in Vietnam. And the new laws create separate legal frameworks for selection of investors for PPP projects and IPP projects. They are now entirely different. For PPP project, the change is very positive. In the past, everything is subject to tender. Under the new PPP law, it's possible for a PPP project to be subject to competitive negotiation process to select investor rather than just public tendering. And competitive negotiation might be applied in one of these three cases, which is very much probable for the larger scale energy project. First, if only three interested investors satisfy the project requirements under the, during the preliminary survey, survey process. This is the first scenario. Second scenario, the project applies high technology falling on the list of encouraged high technology. And third scenario, the project applies new technology. So these are very probable for the larger scale energy project, such as LNG or offshore wind. Um, and then the next thing is the prime minister is now given the special power to decide on a special case to determine the selection of investor based on the particular conditions of the project. So these soften the, the requirement for possible public tendering to select investor for PPP power projects. We would go to, now we talk about selection of investor for PPP projects. Now we go to selection of investor for IPP projects. IPP projects would be divided into four categories for purpose of determining whether tender is required. Uh, to select the investor. And those categories mainly focus on the status of the land that is proposed for the project. So first category, clean land managed by the state. What does it mean by clean? Clean mean that all of the land has been cleared from existing occupants. Compensation has been paid to existing occupants. The land is not entirely ready for investment and it is currently managed by the state. Then in that case, selection of investor must be done via auction of the land use rights. Second category, also clean land, but the investor holds valid land use rights. So this is different from first case, right? Land is also clean and clear from existing occupants, but the investor already pay for all of those costs and the investor now hold valid land use rights. In this case, Selection of the investor can be done via direct appointment of the investor who is holding the land use rights. Third category is the land in industrial zone or land in high tech zones. In this case, it is also direct appointment, which is permitted. Why is it? Because in this case, land would be mainly subleased from the developer as a private arrangement and land would not be granted or leased from the government itself. Therefore, selection of the investor can also be done via a direct appointment. Last scenario, last scenario is in cases where land is subject to land clearing and resettlement, which means land is not clean, or land is proposed for a project for which rental exemption is applicable is an investment incentive in these two cases, which is the last category, tendering is required for selection of investor. So we have talked over some key changes that might affect both PPP and IPP projects or only IPP projects. Now we go through a summary of the key new changes under the new PPP laws. These are the four key changes, which should be noted. First, relating to equity transfer. A key question for all of the PPP project is that if the sponsors, which are the 
direct owner of the equity in the project company wish to transfer the equity to outsiders, to other equity owner, then what is the requirements? The laws have always been silent on this. The new laws introduce the restrictions on this. The new laws say transfer of equity capital to outsiders is permitted only after a commercial operation of the project. So during, before commercial operation, no transfer. Second restriction, transfer of equity capital among the equity participants in the project before commercial operation is permitted, provided that the lead investor retains at least 30% and each other investor retains at least 15% of the equity in the project. Now, what is the implication to investors here? The, 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 the lenders, right? The lender would ask if I take a security over the equity capital in the project and I want to enforce the security before the commercial operation, can I enforce the security? The laws don't give the answer to this question. And therefore, this is subject to monitoring and probably has to be handled in the PPP project documents to be signed with the state authorities. And it is an issue to monitor. But this issue also highlights the importance of structuring the project company holding at different holding levels. So that if a transfer of equity is required, it would be much more efficient if the transfer occurs in a holding company outside Vietnam rather than directly at the project company level. The second important change is the GGG, the government guarantee and undertaking. The government guarantee, what is the important change? For years, for BOT power project in Vietnam, the government always include in the government guarantee, a guarantee for the payment obligations of EVN under the PPA. The new PPP law removed this element, raising a big question in the future. Does that mean that the government would no longer guarantee EVN obligations under the PPA to be monitored? The next key change for PPP projects is relating to the deadline for financial arrangement. The new law now say that the sponsors must obtain financial arrangement within 12 to 18 months after the PPP contract is executed with the government. If there is a delay in the financial arrangement, the project shall be dealt with in accordance with the conditions in the investor selection tender package, meaning that it's possible that the, the, the investor might be disqualified if the financial arrangement is not obtained in time. The last important change that I would like to highlight is the governing law. The new law now say the project contracts to be signed with the government or other state authorities would be governed by Vietnamese laws, which is another very important change because for years, these project contracts might have been governed by foreign law, namely UK law or Singapore law. So these are the key changes I would like to highlight under the new PPP legal framework. So what are the key takeaway? We have talked about major changes and probably the key takeaway about those major changes that would affect the power project include, first, special incentive corporate income tax of 5% is introduced for the first time in Vietnam history to be monitored. And the government has introduced a draft decision on this topic. Second, land use can be a market access condition for foreign investors to watch. Third, foreign investor equivalent threshold is changed from at least 51% to over 50%. This is relating to the concept of who would be treated as a foreign investor. Fourth, in principle approval jurisdiction for large scale energy projects in the provincial authority 
and no longer with the prime minister, a very positive change. Next, selection of investor regimes are now separate for IPP and PPP projects. Next, the statutory timeline for financial invest arrangement is set for PPP power projects. 12 to 18 months after the project documents are signed. And finally, the governing law for PPP project contracts must be Vietnamese laws. A lot of legislations and policies are being evaluated. So everything is to be monitored, especially during the upcoming two to three years. What's being expected? First, we are waiting for the new draft of the Power Master Plan number eight. We hope it will be released this autumn and finalize an issue within this year, but to watch. We are waiting for the new fit-in tariff for solar and wind power when the current uh, deadline for the fit-in tariff expires. We are waiting for the circular on DPPA pilot program. And once this pilot program is launched, which means that it's possible for uh, power generation facilities to sell power to private users and not only to EVM. Currently, only rooftop can be sold to private users. The next thing we are waiting is, we already mentioned earlier, the new decision on the special investment incentive of 5%. The decision, a draft decision has already been released and for co to collect opinions from business associations, that is another thing to watch. We are also waiting for the auction regime for renewable energy to be crystallized. And then, and then to see who would be subject to these auction requirements. The next and longer term is the legal regime for LNG to power if they are developed as IPP and not PP. And finally, the draft PPP contract template mentioned in the new PPP decree, uh, the draft template for particularly power projects would need to be developed and issued, which probably would also be something in the longer term. These are the key legislations and policies being evaluated by the government for us to watch and it's probably be criticized sometime during the next two to three years. Um, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you so much all for joining this session. Now I would see if you have any questions for me. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Duvin. That was quite insightful. Um, we have a couple of questions. I think one question, uh, I, uh, Nguyen Kuang just wants clarification. I believe you said uh, that most IPP or PPP, most, uh, would not be subject to jurisdiction of prime minister. Does that mean that there would be some IPP that may be subject to jurisdiction of the prime minister? Just a clarification from you. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for the question. There might be, even though that is not particularly related to energy, because, for example, under the laws, if the project requires clearing the land um, and relocation a certain number of people in an area, in a, a suburban area or urban area, then depending on the number of the relocation requirements, the project might be subject to the jurisdiction of the prime minister. Even though this might be not the case, given that uh, LNG project now likely would be located in areas that are not densely uh, populated, uh, but that is an example of what is possible. Great, okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, also, uh, we had a question about um, the effective date of the new law. The new laws that we are, we are discussing in this session uh, took effect in January, 2021. Thank you very much. And uh, I believe that's it uh, from Duen and from uh, Vila. Thank you very much. Um, if any of the attendees have any further questions for Duen, uh, you can email uh, her colleague, Lyra. Uh, her email ID is, uh, I've mentioned it in the chat, lyra.dasio at vlaf.com.vn.
Again, thank you very much. Now we move on to, to change the pace a little bit. We move on to uh, Q&A with the Z-Grid Vector of DNV. I'd like her to join. Hi. Hello, Z-Grid. Good to see you. Hi, hey, everybody. Now we'll do a quick uh, Q&A and, uh, you know, we wanted to call it, I wanted to call it a fireside chat with Z-Grid Vector, but it's too hot for that right now. In, uh, in Hong Kong especially. <laughs> so well, thank you very much for joining and uh, we'll kick off this Q&A with a question uh, about your recent uh, report that had come out, the DNV's Energy trans uh, Transition Outlook for 2020. So if anyone wants to see this, uh, this outlook or this report, they can go on to uh, DNV's website. Am I correct? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, you might have to register with your email address and, uh, and then you can download it. Yes, it's free of charge. Great. That's how we like it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So about that uh, particular uh, report, uh, can you unpack some of the key insights about this future of renewable energy that emerged from, from your report? Sure. Maybe a little bit uh, to the background, uh, you might wonder why are you publishing something uh, free of charge, which is called the Energy Transition Outlook. And this is something uh, DNV is publishing uh, since a few years. Um, if you look in our business, we are a service provider um, in maritime and in energy. And as such, uh, having insights in not only renewables, but also, of course, uh, fossil energy and uh, also in one of the sector, which is a large uh, consumer of uh, fossil fuel. And uh, actually, we were asking ourselves exactly the question that Yuen was just asking, what's next? Given that we have so many experts uh, in-house uh, and uh, then also being a neutral player in the industry owned by a foundation in Norway, not sort of a listed uh, whatever company, we felt like we might be a good uh, organization to host this. We were getting in not only our own uh, experts, but also partners in academia, basically to forecast uh, the development of, of the energy sector, both from the demand uh, and supply um, angle. And uh, doing this, uh, we are doing a best estimate. This is clear. We are looking into this question until uh, 20, 2050. And of course, we can't read the crystal ball uh, either. But instead of looking into a single forecast with scenarios, we are just doing an estimate and it's uh, published annually. So there might be shifts, uh, especially I think post-COVID, we will see some changes. And we are observing long-term uh, dynamics, uh, looking back from 1980 to 2050 in this regard, and uh, also having a good understanding of the continuous development. How will things be more efficient, um, uh, which helps to predict uh, the future a bit. And uh, we are also observing policy trends, um, which is not an easy task. We've just had these very, very insightful and interesting presentations uh, uh, from David and Duyen about um, uh, Thailand and uh, Vietnam. And only looking in two countries, you understand there is a certain complexity. If you now want to scale this globally, uh, this is quite a task. And we also try to, to look into behavioral changes. Um, COVID is a good example that, for example, people will travel less, work more from home, there might be less uh, consumption. So this is the background. Um, key takeaways, basically, I'm just, there's a lot of, it's over 200 pages, a lot of content in this, but the key uh, takeaways we have in our last year's report, the 2021 20, uh, is yet to come, is that COVID uh, reduced uh, energy demands uh, by 8%. I think it's uh, no surprise, but we are considering this as a dip only. It will peak up uh, or it already started to peak up uh, during this year but from a lower level. And as such, uh, it has slightly accelerated the move in a positive manner. We also believe that uh, rapid uh, electrification uh, and dominated by, by both solar and wind uh, transform the energy mix uh, significantly over time that there is one difficult field, which is the decarbonization of the, the harder to abate uh, sectors, uh, for example, heavy industries, transport, where I'm not talking passenger transport, but uh, more shipping and aviation. 
So it will be hard to, to still reach um, the Paris uh, Agreement targets. However, we believe it's possible. Huh? The technology is there uh, to deliver on the ambition to stay well below the two degrees uh, global warming. But what is needed um, is stronger policies uh, in order to scale here. There is a lot of content in it, uh, but I think if you, this is sort of what I would pick uh, the most important takeaways uh, from, from our ETO 2020. Very interesting, yes. And I would, I would ask all the attendees today uh, to have a look at this report. Uh, you just have to resist and you'll get it. Quite, quite good insights, I would say. Now, you can, you can tell how excited I was for this particular Q&A because, Sigrid, I forgot to introduce you. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so very quickly, Zigrid is the, the head of uh, group legal for Middle East and Asia Pacific at DNB. Uh, as she mentioned, it's a leading global independent expert in risk management and quality assurance. It's headquartered in Norway. Zigrid, uh, you're duly qualified in Germany and uh, uh, the role of sort of solicitors of England and Wales. Uh, you've got a diverse team of highly dedicated lawyers working from Dubai. Shanghai and Singapore. So, and, and before moving to Singapore, I believe you were in Hamburg and in Shanghai. Yes. So, great. So, a lot of experience around uh, uh, the, the Northern Hemisphere. That's great. Now, just following up on the question, I know we have a lot of in house counsel uh, present today within the energy sector who are attending this webinar. Um, can you point out some of these, uh, as an in-house counsel yourself, can you point, point out some common pain points for in-house legal teams when they're working on renewable energy initiatives with their company? Yeah, uh, I think I will uh, limit myself to two uh, pain points there. I think uh, the overarching theme, especially out here in, in Asia Pacific, is this uh, high legal and regulatory uncertainty. Um, we've just seen also in the presentation, legislation is quickly shifting one way or the other. It can be helpful, it can be hindering. Um, if you compare this, for example, to Europe, where you have sort of bundled legislation and everyone is marching in the same direction, uh, this is absolutely not the case uh, out here. While, while some governments would incentivize uh, renewable energy, others are more reluctant, having different agendas, uh, maybe also simply being more reliant on, on uh, fossil uh, energy, or maybe having resources uh, itself. So it is uh, difficult to navigate this, um, especially if you are not a law firm on the ground, but you are a legal team uh, which is covering many countries. Um, you are not that much in depth in, in all the subjects, so um, uh, you need to be able to quickly find out do I need to involve external counsel to get clarity or is it maybe something I can adjust my, myself? But, but overall, it's often not very clear in, in policies and in the law what is uh, required here. The second point, I would not only limit this to, to uh, renewables energy, it is um, that the longer I'm, I'm in this uh, business, uh, it's 15 plus years, uh, my feeling is that contracting uh, becomes more and more challenging, especially larger players are going out with more and more onerous terms. And of course, uh, uh, being a large player ourselves, we are gearing up uh, as well. So if you, if you compare what companies have in their head and in their internal policies, what uh, standards need to be ticked and matched uh, when entering into an agreement, the both parties around the table are often far off. And um, what I miss a bit is a certain ethic in contracting that you simply sit down and discuss uh, what makes sense here when it comes to, to distributing uh, the risks and uh, the rewards. And this is not necessarily eased by the fact that uh, also procurement gets more and more professionalized. So uh, what often happens is that uh, a customer's procurement talks to our procurement, and then there is a contract manager, and then there is a legal manager. But it takes time until you do reach uh, the level where you can discuss on eye level and take uh, decisions. And my experience also is that once you are there, once you sit at this table and you speak, you reach a decision. It's just uh, very time consuming uh, and, and 
not leading uh, anywhere. So this gearing up of uh, contract terms, uh, I would consider this as a pain point for me. Great, thanks. And I'm sure uh, a lot of the in-house counsel feel, uh, other in-house counsel attending today feel the same pain points. Uh, and, and to that, if anyone has questions for Zigrid, you can use the Q&A box and we can, uh, she's here, she's got time. This is a good time to ask any questions. Um, what I wanted to actually ask you also is your view as to the outlook of alternate, alternative and re renewable energy. And what do you see as likely areas for opportunity or growth for attorneys practicing in this area, be it counsel who are private practice or in-house counsel? What are the growth areas for opportunities for them within the sector? Yeah, I, there I can maybe <laughs> refer to the above. Uh, where you have the a pain point for an in-house lawyer, there is business for lawyers. Um, so actually um, helping your organization or your, your client uh, through these uh, constantly evolving policies and legislation, be it about car around carbon pricing, support for, for hydrogen, um, fuel energy tax, there are a lot of schemes. Staying on top of this and uh, uh, guiding them and uh, maybe uh, promoting your business if you are external with uh, uh, newsletters around uh, these ever evolving uh, policies, I think is a good idea. Um, and same for in-house. I think uh, the in-house uh, capability is a bit more hands-on in the sense that you will work directly with your business people and negotiating things like contract where you contracts where you may be less often uh, go back to, to external counsel. But overall, I think it is clear that uh, renewable and alternative uh, energy, it's, it's a growing sector. It's a sector with high legislative uncertainty. So I think it's uh, a business opportunity uh, for people who like to practice law, be it in-house uh, or external. Great, well, thank you very much for that. Um, the next question uh, I wanted to ask you is, generally speaking, is it common for alternative and renewable energy practitioners to concentrate in a specific area. For example, if it's wind, they will concentrate on wind or if it's solar and so on. So I believe if you look at legal education, uh, we are clearly not yet there. Um, uh, there you might have somebody having specialized uh, during uh, academic studies on, on energy as such, uh, and you might have somebody more in the oil and gas uh, fossil uh, area and somebody more in the renewables. But what I haven't seen from the education so far is uh, that they would differentiate uh, in between the renewable sectors. However, having, having said that this is a growing business, uh, I believe uh, this is something short to come. And it might first kick off uh, in law firms, uh, with simply more, more possibility to scale such a specialist. But I can uh, sense this uh, in our legal team in, in DNB that we have, of course, uh, within the group of lawyers, certain go-to people who are uh, extremely experienced or skilled uh, in, in solar or wind. Uh, then offshore wind is, uh, is specifically a large sector for us. Uh, so I believe this will come over time. Uh, I don't believe you can go to a law school and say, uh, I want to specialize in, in the law around uh, wind energy or solar. Um, but, but I believe this is uh, something to be observed. And back to our energy transition outlook, um, uh, with the prediction of uh, uptake uh, in renewables um, uh, over time, uh, I'm even quite certain it will come sooner or later. Sure, okay. Um, now, how do you split incentives and the lack of regulations to prevent progress in the transition to more forms of renewable energy? Yeah. This is a, a difficult one, if you ask me, okay. um, because there are so many aspects uh, to it. And it comes down uh, again to that different governments, countries are pursuing uh, uh, different agendas here. 
Um, and it comes to, to, I think what Duyen also said, uh, market access uh, and uh, Vietnam is not even for me the biggest pain point here, that it's sometimes uh, difficult to simply navigating uh, in, a, in a certain market in the renewables field because you might have local content uh, requirements or um, uh, other sort of incentives to go or to leave um, uh, the market. So, and if you sit in a company like DNB, it is a bit mixed messages, uh, maybe not from one government, uh, but if you sit in the region, um, it is uh, different depending on, on where you are. And um, I think the, the leap we need to take uh, in order to move forward in the right direction, which should be in, in all our interest to, to have uh, uh, climate uh, change goals uh, reached, um, is to make this market of renewable uh, and sustainable energy attractive for investors. Uh, and what an investor would need um, is a certain stability in, in regulations um, to go in uh, with large amount, especially if you, if you uh, consider the, the large venture capital or private equity firms. Um, they require a, a certain stability and foreseeability. Um, and this is what we need. And I think with a view on, on the Paris Agreement, if we don't get there, unif maybe not completely uniformly, but in the, with the same TINA, we will uh, not reach the goal, um, which would be more than said, if you ask me. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting. I think, uh, I think the world itself, everybody is moving towards that thought where uh, you know, we need to protect our climate protect our atmosphere. Um, I was just watching uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, video today after, after he went into space and came back. And he, and he said that once when you look at Earth from above, you can see that the atmosphere is so thin and we really need to take care of it. Now, I, I think hopefully that would uh, empower him to internally put uh, uh, you know, uh, regulations internally in place, which are pro-climate and pro um, you know, saving our environment. Uh, that's the, the zeitgeist, I guess. That, that's all, all the regulations are working. But I don't want to know the carbon footprint of this flight. <laughs> <huh? laughs> well, hopefully it's a small price to pay for a big change later <laughs> on. Um, we have, I have one more qu last question, but before that, uh, I would ask uh, all the attendees, if anyone has any questions for Zgrid, please feel free to uh, uh, ask them here. If we run, run out of time, uh, we can uh, ask us separately and uh, perhaps do a Q&A in our magazine. In fact, uh, we did a Q&A, we published a Q&A with you uh, in our last issue of In-House Community Magazine. So I'd ask, request everyone over here to uh, go on to www.inhousecommunity.com and uh, search for Zgrid. We've got a wonderful Q&A that discusses uh, more about renewable energy, but also how in-house council, uh, how in-house council team, uh, in-house legal team works. Um, lastly, I know we don't have that many students uh, or recent graduates on this uh, this webinar. Hopefully, we will post it on our YouTube channel or online for young uh, graduates to to listen to. But what advice can you offer these law students uh, who are interested in career? Uh, in alternative and renewable energy? Yeah, first of all, I think it's a very good idea. As I said, I believe it's a, a growing field in the legal industry. And uh, I will not do the drill into the legal knowledge. Um, I think it is clear if you want to, to have a career in, in law, at least the large companies, uh, be it a law firm or in-house, uh, would uh, require stellar academics. Um, but if you want to, to go into uh, energy, renewable energy, um, you need to understand the industry and the industry is uh, technology driven. So you need to bring not only willingness, uh, but, but you need to enjoy technical facts, technical um, uh, sort of cases you might work on, you need to understand what uh, your either your external client or, or your internal uh, client is doing. 
And in addition, uh, you need to understand the financials uh, around your company. Um, when I onboard uh, younger lawyers, it's something I'm sometimes surprised with because um, uh, as a company, we are not here to entertain some lawyers with uh, exciting cases. Uh, we are there to, to have a financially sound result uh, and to secure the jobs uh, we are offering. And uh, for this, you need to understand how the business works, where it is leveraging. Uh, and it starts with basic, like being able to, to read an uh, annual account uh, and to analyze it and uh, extract some of the information there. And uh, when it comes, of course, to the technical side, to speak the language of your, of your clients. And I don't mean uh, English or German or Spanish uh, or Mandarin, I mean, um, understand their term terminology um, and show a genuine interest in what they do. And on the flip side, uh, you need to be able to, to sort of bring across your legal message uh, and your legal content in a manner that they understand it. Uh, because if you, if you want them to follow certain advice, uh, they can only do so if they understand you. And uh, uh, this is sometimes obviously difficult for lawyers. Um, uh, it's also sometimes difficult for external law firms. So being in-house, you sometimes uh, bridge this a bit and you act even a bit like a translator. Um, and lastly, soft skills. Uh, we are all selling a service. Um, so you have to, to be able to do this in a, in a decent manner. Uh, being able to navigate difficult uh, conversations because your role uh, might sometimes be to say, well, this is maybe not the best idea or you need to, to negotiate the, this or that, or you need to negotiate even yourself. Um, it's around uh, giving and receiving feedback, uh, being able to navigate in a global economy, uh, intercultural understanding. Um, uh, I sometimes uh, believe that um, uh, this is maybe going forward where more of our legal services might be IA supported. These soft skills uh, will become more and more important. So I can only recommend to, to focus early on in your career on this. Great, thank you very much. Yes, I agree with a lot of, lot of the services you know, AI will be able to do, but whatever human beings can do, they will need soft skills for it. And it's uh, it's very interesting. We recently did a survey with uh, select in-house counsel and asked them what sort of topics you'd be interested in, not just legal topics, but all kinds of topics and soft skill in all different levels of in-house counsel. That's a topic that keeps coming up. So. Uh, Hopefully, we can come up with some soft skill training as well, but uh, it's it's good to get the training or keep uh, refreshed on soft skills all the time. Well, thank you very much, Zigrid. Uh, thank you for taking out the time and giving us your insights. Really appreciate it. And hopefully, we can do more of this uh, non-fireside chat. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very I, much. Pleasure. Now, uh, at the... Today's last presentation, actually, uh, and for me, a very important one, given the cur current political uh, climate in Myanmar, uh, is uh, I'd like to invite William Greenlee and Rohan Bishai from DFDL to present. And now, just quick, quick introduction. Hi, William. Uh, good to see you. Uh, hi, Rohan. Wonderful. So uh, quick introduction. William is uh, the partner uh, and Myanmar and Singapore Managing Director of DFDL. Uh, William's practice focuses on energy projects, M&A, securities, corporate, mining, infrastructure, and project finance. Uh, for about two decades, William has been advising high-profile clients from around the world in large transactions across Asia and North America. Uh, as well as running uh, the DFDL Myanmar and Singapore office. William is active in the firm's regional China desk as well. And Rohan, uh, Rohan is uh, also working for DFDL, his lawyer. Rohan's area of practice includes energy and infrastructure, banking and finance, M&A, corporate and commercial advisory, cross-border investments, telecoms, real estate, intellectual property, and competition. Um, he has an extensive experience with the frontier markets on power projects, 
aviation, banking and finance, and cross-border M&A. Well, they'll be talking about Myanmar's latest market developments of the uh, energy sector in 2021. A lot of changes, I believe. Legal and regulatory framework for projects, land licensing and challenges with the framework, financing options and future outlook. So with that, it's over to you, William and Roy. Uh, you can start sharing your screen and your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Raul, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. It's our pleasure. I will uh, jump right in. I will be doing uh, the first uh, part of this presentation and then Rohan will, will jump in uh, in, uh, in about nine slides or so. So, um, I don't really have to do much more of a biz dev type of introduction. I think Raul, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was excellent. Um, I will say that uh, DFDL has been in Myanmar for over 20 years now. Uh, I myself got there in 2012. Um, it is, uh, a place that I think is still that very exciting and very, um, the, the, the growth potential for Myanmar is still staggering. And I think that although we are at the moment, both due to uh, this Delta variant, uh, which is really hitting hard at, at the moment. And then also, of course, the political situation have, uh, created somewhat of a of a, a slowdown right at this particular moment however it it uh is a country that's not going to let any of this slow it down in my opinion and it it will recover okay enough of my personal two cents aside let's jump right in so energy mining and infrastructure of course is a massive one of the sectors uh or multiple sectors there but generally uh, infrastructure and project finance that is going to continue to uh, be a, a, a very big part of, of uh, foreign investment and uh, opportunities in Myanmar for, for the many uh, years to come. We ourselves have been involved in some of the biggest in the country. Um, and I will, uh, this slide of course talks about uh, uh, some of that, and um, I, I'll, I'll skip this. Uh, I think that we've had enough of our own accolades uh, so already. Uh, here's a couple uh, bullet points on some uh, macro uh, information. Uh, ADB, I'm gonna have to, I'm sorry, my, my part of the, Part of this, there we go, I'm gonna turn that off. Okay, sorry, I just had to get rid of the little sidebar there. So uh, AD, ADB estimates potential solar resources at 27 gigabytes. It is, of course, although a uh, subtropical country uh, and does have a very active and long rainy season, which we're in now, uh, the, the solar is, uh, especially this the, that central, um, Arawadi Delta going all the way up past Napida and Mandalay is incredibly sunny. Approximately 40% of Myanmar has access to electricity. So of course, a huge amount uh, of more electricity is needed. The government aims to establish 40% sustainable power by 2020. This is, this. obviously they haven't reached um, these goals, but it's uh, it 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 is something that they're still trying to achieve. Seventy six by percent by twenty twenty five, and a hundred percent by twenty thirty. Even if you know they don't make those specific goal lines, uh, it's the the government um, uh, will is there to achieve or attempt to achieve. So that's very good for investors. Recent policies to liberalize and decentralize and open the power sector to foreign investment are all still there. Uh, the various uh, foreign investment laws that have liberalized and, and again, the, the, uh, the will of the government is still there to further open up foreign investment, not just in the power sector, but also across the board. 
Of course, uh, with the political situation, one thing to be very conscious of is uh, the the sanctions in Myanmar right now. Really, in my opinion, pretty uh, targeted compared to what it could be and what it was prior to 2012. Um, well, 2015, really, when the uh, then President Barack Obama had removed Myanmar from the uh, American blacklist, and soon thereafter, many other countries did the same. But at the moment, the European Union has, has imposed sanctions on several individuals of the military, and there are travel bans and asset freezes. The U.S. and the U.K. have also imposed sanctions on, uh, uh, well, the U.S. on these two large military uh, holding companies, conglomerates uh, that are owned by the military. Uh, U.K. has imposed sanctions only on, on one of them. Uh, Project Democracy in the Burma Act of 2021 was introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives a couple months ago. Um, it is try it tries or will try and engage with other ASEAN members and uh, help them to try and coordinate some potentially further sanctions. Um, we'll see how that goes. U.S. has issued sanctions on 10 individuals, including General Ming Ong Hlaing and three companies. Uh, of course, uh, the General Ming Ong Hlaing is the general that is uh, uh, heading the current government. Okay, let's move to the next slide, please. Here are a couple of the new laws. Um, they haven't really impacted foreign investment, I'd like to point out right away, but the State Administrative Council, SAC, which is the name of this uh, new governing body, um, has issued these laws. Uh, Amendment of Privacy Law. It, ultimately, these laws, however, have one um, varying degrees of implementation, from my knowledge, very little has actually been implemented. And again, uh, doesn't impact directly on foreign investment uh, negatively. Okay, so um, investment perspective, there is still little optimism though. Um, we have seen a slowdown in our business and of course uh, other uh, professional service providers, not just law firms have also seen that. However, it hasn't been quite as across the board as one might expect. There is still investment, there are still projects, um, and people are hopeful that things will, will improve. Um, the SAC has said many times they are pro-investment, they want to encourage foreign investment. Um, none of the earlier pro-investment laws have been amended, changed to make them more restrictive. So the uh, legal environment is still very much uh, encourages foreign investment. MIL, the Myanmar investment law, still does guarantee the fact that, uh, uh, that there will be no nationalization of any investment or termination of investments, except for these particular uh, uh, conditions here, which are listed. And that, that would be pretty common in most countries' foreign investment laws. And we haven't seen any nationalizations of, of foreign Companies' uh, projects in Myanmar. So so far, that this has been the case. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, oh, and there are still those bilateral investment treaties still in place too. So the Project Bank. This is interesting. This so this is uh, a uh, a program that it basically lists uh, various projects um, that pardon me are are big infrastructure projects and that the government has basically pre-approved. It's a publicly accessible online database called the Project, Project Bank. Um, and it, it's ultimately there, as this slide says, uh, to regulate public-private partnerships. But I think it's also there to just be information as far as what projects one might look towards to invest in. They're not all the projects, of course, in the country, but they are some some big ones in there and they i think more importantly before i go through a couple more of these these bullet points 
they represent the ability for projects that are listed to ultimately obtain a government guarantee. Uh, in the past, the government's been reluctant to provide a government guarantee. Um, what they have done in the past is provide a, a uh, financial backstop. So it, they have stated in the past that they will ultimately be liable for any payments that are due relevant banks. So it doesn't provide the exact same legal function as a uh, government guarantee, but ultimately from a practical perspective provides pretty much the same thing, although it would have to go through a legal process prior to be you know, provided that. But with the PPP, with, with, with this private bank, uh, and if it's listed, then ultimately it can get directly a, a full government guarantee. Um, that I think that's the most the most uh, significant part of this uh, slide and 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 the project bank. PPP projects selected via competitive tender process or Swiss challenge tender process shall seek government support in terms of guarantee. Okay, sorry, this is this is my slide here that covers a little bit more of what I just mentioned, which again I think it's the most important part of this. That that is not just the project bank, but there is uh, such requirements as a debt to equity ratio shall not be lower than 20% of the capital portion of the project exceed 50 million. Any capital invested by the government will not be counted towards the capital invested in the purpose of circulating the project's debt to equity ratio, which makes sense. Ultimately, the government's not going to hamstring or limit itself um, in most aspects of a project. I don't want to suggest, though, that they are unreasonable. I have found that the Myanmar government, the various relevant ministries, in the beginning, when I first started doing projects in 2012 in Myanmar, actually, there wasn't a lot of professional capacity, for example, a power purchase agreement. Uh, I felt that there hadn't been a lot of exposure, possibly, to such agreements and other uh, aspects of an international um, a power project. But now actually that has changed dramatically. And I find that the various Myanmar government officials to be quite experienced and, um, and reasonable. Uh, not to say that I and any investors not going to have to still spend quite a bit of time up in <laughs> Napida uh, negotiating the details. They will, um, but I find them to be reasonable myself. Okay, uh, the investor must demonstrate successful experience with comparable projects and demonstrate environment and environmental and social responsibility, which I think is a great thing. Ultimately, these uh, the various aspects of these projects um, do include environmental and social responsibility. The project company shall be liable to pay guarantee fee set out in the bidding documentation and the investor shall comply with other criteria set out in the bidding documentation. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, Rohan and I are going to uh, switch and he will be running you through uh, some slides now. With, with that, I, I turn it over to you, Rohan. Thank you, William. Um, I would now like to focus the presentation more towards, uh, you know, like a general practical sort of power projects with LNG to power and, and you know, solar power, how the structure works, the licensing framework, any land issues and, and so on and so forth. So a very basic sort of model has been drawn here where you can see that, that sponsors, you know, set up an SPV in Myanmar, which is right now very simple. You can, you can set this company up in, in, in two days, it's entirely online. And then you have two aspects of it. One is the solar power plant transmission lines, which is, which is one side of it. And the other is when you have an LNG to power sort of base where you have an agreement with a vessel company, you set up your terminal, and then you go on and, and set up the power project and, and you know, uh, negotiate with the government for licenses and the agreements. 
moving on. Yeah. So this is the we've drawn out a rough, uh, you know, estimated project approval roadmap and how exactly the licensing and agreement framework works in Myanmar. So first you have the proposal, which uh, the indicative proposal through the line ministry, which is uh, the Ministry of uh, Electricity and Energy, which will give the uh, successful bidder the notice to proceed. And then you have the various stages, which is following from phase one to phase five, where the most important uh, implementation agreement and the power purchase agreement will be negotiated and finally you know, approved upon by both the government as well as the parties. And, you know, the, the, the most important ministries which will be taking a lead in such stage is the Ministry of Planning, Finance and Industry, the Ministry of Electricity and Energy, the Attorney Government's Office. And then finally, it will actually go on to the cabinet level from where you'll have the signature coming in. Then you have the project agreements, the, the financing documents, the which are the loan documents, security documents, and uh, the BOT agreement, and if a specific project has a government guarantee undertaking, which will ultimately be need to be, you know, discussed and negotiated with the government again, and that takes roughly four to five months from the notice to proceed. Importantly, after this stage of of negotiating your initial uh, implementation agreement, your PPA, comes the approval part where fundamentally you have, you need to receive the approval from the Myanmar Investment Commission or the special economic zone if the project is based in a special econom economic zone. Um, you know, usually the Myanmar Investment Commission has been very, uh, we would say that they've been very uh, streamlined with their process. They are, they are active and they are responsive and they conduct meetings in a very organized manner. You know, usually there might be certain delays, but the timeline would vary from three months to six months. Right now, I would say that it might take a bit longer owing to the difficult circumstances, but generally the MIC is very, you know, they want to approve investments and they want to take this country forward. And then once your MIC approval is received, you go on and get the approvals from the environmental committee, from the Ministry of Commerce, say for some, something like a, an export import and, and you know, LNG transportation. You have these various ministries with whom you deal with. And then once you have those permits and approvals in place, you go on and, and get your uh, financing done which is through your de various development banks and you register your security uh, with the regulators and then you're good to go with the project. Okay, so we just shortly touch upon some of the most important uh, project documentation for a, for a power pro project and then importantly for an LNG to power project. Of course, you have the power purchase agreement, which I will discuss some of the key clauses from a model power purchase agreement later. You have the concession agreement, you have the related government guarantee. This is if the government is providing a guarantee which is backed by the MOPFI's mandate. Then you have the EPC contracts for the power plant, the ONM contracts, and then if you switch or if, if we look at a, an LNG to power project, you'll have ship building, ship leasing agreements, ship management contracts, shipyard supervise, supervision contracts, time charter parties, LNG supply agreements, terminal use agreements. And finally, you'll have, of course, you'll have the constitutional documents and the co corporate authorizations of this special purpose vehicle that we spoke about, which will ultimately implement the project. Okay, in terms of, of timelines of this project, of this entire approval process, I'll just run you through quickly with the MIC permit as discussed, you know, takes between three to six months, but it should ideally come within 12 weeks. Then you have the uh, approval for, now if it's an LNG to power project, you'll, you'll have to take the approval from the port authority. That usually takes a little longer, but, but you know, these are all simultaneous approval processes. So you can have it one, 
you can have one of them while applying for or negotiating for the other others then you need to take your central bank of myanmar's approval for international financing agreements of course you need the approval of of the moee for the construction of the power plant which takes about 4 to 8 weeks uh, of course for the for the for the equipments and and the material that you bring into the country you need the approval of of the ministry of commerce these are short approval timelines of 1 to 2 weeks 4 to 8 weeks now if it's a downstream which which will be for uh, these uh, power project downstream uh, activities you need approval from the ministry of construction for the sale of the lng you need approval from the ministry of uh, electricity and energy for the petroleum and petroleum products then you need a license for your oil and gas carriers from the motc and of course you'll need your license for the distribution of petroleum products and this this can actually all be done uh, through a blanket or a, or a you know a combined application to these various ministries if if there are various heads under which you are actually applying you need the jetty approval from the mpa which is the myanmar port authority and and very importantly you need to have your environmental and social impact assessments your ecc which is the environmental compliance certificate in place now this the government has struggled in the past to issue this has taken a long time 6 to 12 months is the indicative timeline but there are still many companies which have actually not gone ahead and got this but started construction so it's it's on the basis of an in principle approval so the company would actually go ahead and and, and submit the environmental management plan and receive an a sort of endorsement from uh, the monrec and and that's the basis on which they'll go ahead and start their construction but ideally uh, to be absolutely good in terms of office order you would need your ecc in place okay now just to touch shortly on how a power project is financed in in a, in a nutshell that it can be divided into a debt part and an equity part the debt part is usually we we've seen these large development banks such as the adb the ifc which has financed these large scale projects in myanmar and of course the equity portion can be financed by the members consortium through shareholder loans preferred or common equity we've seen the usual ratio to be around 70s to 30 or 80s to 20 but in terms of documentation and and since the cbm would ultimately need to approve a foreign loan we've seen that the cbm is comfortable with around 70 to 30 share uh, debt equity ratio and the you know if it's a shareholder loan the cbm usually wants it to be lower rate interest loans and and 7% is sort of the rough uh, uh, baseline on which companies should operate some of the commercial issues we've seen in the past of course you know myanmar has not been too forthcoming in the past to issue a sovereign or a government guarantee but but of course as as william pointed out they, there has been contractual guarantees embedded within the ppa or concession agreement which ultimately acts very very similar to a sovereign guarantee so that that sort of still being implemented and and i i think sooner than later we'll actually have in place a formal sovereign guarantee backed by the mopfi one of the major concerns now is is with respect to uh, the conversion of of a project site now you know most of this land that we are talking about in myanmar is is government land or grant land and it needs to be converted into commercial use before we actually go ahead and use it for a park so this has been time consuming which sort of uh, tinkers around with the construction milestones as listed in the ppa or or concession agreement now as i mentioned procuring an environmental con compliance certificate is has often been very time consuming another challenge is to actually come to an agreement with respect to how or or what would be the mode in which your tariffs will be negotiated as far as the currency is concerned so the entire negotiation negotiation process 
with the government is is time consuming okay now as i mentioned previously i would touch base on some of the uh, you know key factors or key points of a power purchase agreement we have seen model power purchase agreements being used sorry being used in the uh, past for the recent solar tender which was passed in 2020 where we had roughly 1 gigawatt of uh, of solar outage and and we've seen that these projects are now sort of starting to come online the dfdl is assisting with quite a few of them 14 to be precise out of the 29 agreed tower tower sites so now in terms of payment mechanism tpg would pay for actual delivered energy at the agreed ta tariff rate the delivery schedule will be based on a merit order system Uh, the epg will purchase the delivered energy up to 105% of the estimated contracted energy exceeding which the estimated contracted energy would be available to the epg for free now in terms of the financial structure we've seen that the invoicing would be in usd uh, but the payments would be made in mmk which often would be a problem for foreign investors but we've seen that uh, they have gone ahead and and agreed uh with with this structure now the ppa comes with a performance bank guarantee which has to be deposited by the investor to the myanmar foreign trade bank which is of course a government bank uh it has to be placed within 14 days from signing the ppa and has to be valid for at least 30 days after the construction operation date and once the construction begins it has to be released within a period of 10 days so in cases of default the pga will actually have the right to draw against the performance bank guarantee if you delay the there is i mean if you delay in terms of your construction operation date deadline then the epga has the right to uh, you know it attracts a penalty of mmk 150000 per day which is roughly uh, 100 us dollars then another penalty is that you know usd 30000 per megawatt of shortfall if the net generating power is less than 80% of the estimated contracted energy now we see that you know in terms of the ppa they they've made the, uh, the spv the the company which actually holds interest have a certain degree of control without too many fluctuations or or flexibility around that part so you know up to 4 years off from the commercial operate operation date the company may transfer at 50 only up to 50% of the original shareholding so they want to keep it constant for at least 4 years and then between the 4th and the 6th year it can be up to 25% and then further relaxations would be only on the basis of ad hoc approvals and negotiations with the epg the company and epg you know if so now the epg at times you know previously the epg was operating under the guise of the mepe which was a different ministry and they had to sort of assign various ppas to the epg so they have also kept this uh, ambit open uh, under the model ppa where uh, you know the ppa can actually be uh, assigned with prior written con Uh, with written written consent by both the company as well as the epgp uh, vice versa okay so in terms of security interest over project project agreement ip revenues it can be done for the purposes of financing which is a positive move and which is of course seen in such large scale projects across the world subcontracting is allowed which of course we see in epc and omn agreements and uh, but the company of course will be liable to the epg for its operations okay so the project company has to maintain marine and air cargo insurance they have to maintain an all risk constructions insurance a commercial general liability insurance and and other insurances as applicable under the myanmar investment law and other laws uh, which are in force in myanmar of course you have an insurance for workmen as well prior after the commercial operation period 
the workmen who are, who are working for your company will need to be insured. And uh, yeah, and you'll also need to have an all risks insurance, which includes all of your machinery and equipment. The governing law of the PPA is Myanmar law, but we've seen that the dispute resolution process is done by uh, the SIAC, Singapore Investment Arbitration com com uh, Rules, is, is the preferred mode of dispute resolution under the PPA. Now, as far as, as we've seen the Myanmar market, you know, Last year was a major boom as far as uh, uh, your uh, solar power was concerned. And we also worked on a couple of LNG to power projects as well. Some of them are already coming online and, 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 and the Myanmar Investment Commission has actually been pretty proactive in terms of, of approving investments. That they have gone ahead and approved 15 foreign investments in the past month one major gas to power investment. And, and, you know, recently they've gone ahead and issued another solar power tender on, on the 24th of May for nine new sites. The bidders, the interested bidders would actually need to submit their documents by the 11th of August. But considering the present situation in Myanmar, there is every likelihood that that bidding period will be extended, but we need to wait and see if bidders are actually going ahead and, and submitting documents by that date itself. So the, so I mean, to summarize it, Myanmar, although undergoing a lot of change, is still approving investments and is of course open to foreign investment, the, the liquidity of banks. And, and right now you see the flexibility in the market has, has improved and we can only hope for a brighter future in the next few years as far as energy is concerned. With that, I would turn it over to William for some final thoughts. Thank you, Rohan. Uh, again, uh, I think that uh, ultimately the, uh, the details that Rohan has provided uh, for such a project is uh, um, pretty tried and true. Uh, I, there hasn't been, again, any big changes or, or really any relevant changes to the process or uh, the validity of the various laws since the, the, the you know, February 1st. So all of this is still, is still in play. And ultimately, in my opinion, the, especially the macroeconomic reasons to invest in Myanmar are still very much present. Uh, and, and the, legal scenario uh, environment has improved drastically over the uh, uh, decade that I've been doing projects in Myanmar. So from those perspectives, it's still a, a very interesting and dynamic place to, to invest. Um, I think once the country gets the uh, uh, this Delta variant uh, COVID uh, under control, um, the country is going to be roaring back. So with that, uh, I thank you for your, for your uh, uh, involvement. And um, of course, we'd be very happy to help if you had any further questions later, but I think we do have time to answer a couple now. So I will uh, turn it over to Rahul. Yeah, well, thank you very much, William and Rohan. That uh, very insightful presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions very briefly. I think you might have answered these during the course of the presentation, but how has the present market situation affected existing projects in Myanmar? Well, some of the projects that I've been involved with, they have, uh, it, it slowed some of it down, especially those projects that still needed some face-to-face -face time between the investors and, and the government. Uh, Rohan, do you have, uh, from your perspective, any information or any opinion? Yes, William. So, you know, as you mentioned, the projects have slowed down and, you know, some of the investors, because they've not been able to actually come into the country, they've been seeking for extensions to the government and the government, we've seen in a couple of cases that the government has actually allowed, uh, milestones to be extended due to quote-unquote force majeure events of COVID. 
um, and and but but also we we've seen a couple of projects actually going ahead seamlessly and and the investment commission actually going ahead and and approving these investments so it's 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 still working but of course once the situation in the country becomes better we'll be flowing through with these projects in a much more streamlined manner Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Rohan and uh, William. And that's the end of our uh, our webinar today. Um, thank you very much to all the attendees um, uh, for uh, taking on the time. And uh, especially a big thanks to all our co-hosts, uh, Chandler, MHM, VLAF, DFTL, and also to uh, Zgrid Wetworth for taking out the time and uh, uh, giving your presentations and engaging with in-house counsel. Um, thank you very much again. Now, right after this survey ends, there will be a, a post-webinar survey. I'd ask all the attendees to fill this. Um, we get some information back so that we can make the future presentations much more uh, tighter and better. Well, thank you once again, and hopefully we'll see you all soon, uh, perhaps in a live event. Great. Thank you very much. Take care.